Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. And we encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Hello, listeners. Uh, this is Jeff Cromendike um, with uh, Security First Insurance Agency, and uh, we're with your part of your expert team uh, network here. I've got uh, Mike Miller with Miller and Associates. Good to see you, Mike. How you Thanks, doing? Thanks, Jeff. Good. How are you doing? Great. Fantastic. Good. Good, uh, good to be with you today. And uh, Nate Merrill with uh, Goodspeed and Merrill is here with us uh, today. Nate. Uh, Blessings to, to you. Good to see you. Both a host and a guest, I guess. Yes, you <laughs> kind of are. Uh, we do have kind of a. Uh, dual guest uh, uh, combination here uh, today. Uh, Nate's going to be doing uh, some of um, our, uh, our talking today, but uh, I do want to introduce our, uh, our guest that is uh, new to our listeners. And uh, by the way, Carl Frank is not with us today. He's uh, For a doing, change. Yeah, he's doing some other things, uh, probably more important things like uh, tending to his family, so that's good. Um, love love uh, that he's doing that. But um, I've got a uh, uh, we've got a guest here with us today, um, uh, Rich Erickson um, from A Link, uh, which is actually a uh, independent uh, uh, brokerage for captive programs, captive insurance in particular. Um, personally, I am I am really excited that you're here. This is a um, uh, I wouldn't say like up and coming concept because Nate, you introduced this to our group several years ago. Yeah, in fact, um, last year about this time when we were kind of. I think dealing with the very early stages of COVID, and we all gave our our recommendations, our number one opportunity for 2020 at the time. I said, "Sure, looks like a captive insurance year because of all these business risks that people never thought would happen, but were now happening to everybody all the, all the same time." So, and and that's what I think we're going to talk about is how captives kind of address some of those risks that people are now recovering from. Absolutely. And uh, so we were on the receiving end of many of those phone calls coming in from our clients. Of course, uh, we're in the uh, more traditional risk transfer business, uh, which uh, involves insurance companies. And um, there are a lot of uh, insurance forms out there that just failed to deliver on, um, in essence, what we experienced here in the last year. Um, specifically uh, business income coverage or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, the Supreme Courts have been packed with uh, cases brought um, to the courts against insurance companies on, on the uh, actual um, uh, writing of these particular forms claiming that there should be coverage and uh, the, the forms have actually with st with, withheld uh, a lot of the uh, the cases, um, the forms uh, f written specifically for business income anyway, um, are uh, are holding their their water right now. There aren't haven't been too many settlements uh, in the favor of the clients, unfortunately, or the the um, claimants. Um, but uh, captive insurance, um, I think, uh, really. Uh, introduces uh, a whole new solution to risk transfer and uh, business income in a pandemic type world that we're in right now, or the pandemic being the peril that we're talking about, uh, certainly um, uh, is taken care of in a captive market. So um, yeah, again, we're going to um, uh, kind of have uh, Nate and also Rich uh, tell us a little bit more about captives. Uh, in this podcast, we want to really kind of introduce the concept from a very high level 
and uh, and go from there. I have a feeling, Mike, uh, when these two guys start talking, you and I aren't going to have much to say. So, we'll, if you have any questions, we'll be going <laughs> silent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and just kind of uh, piggyback off of something you said there, which I think should be understood as we dive into captive insurance is a captive insurance company is an insurance company, but it's not an insurance company in the the way that people have historically maybe thought of insurance companies as being owned by Warren Buffett or somebody else. This is an insurance company that, I mean, the captive kind of gives the the impression that it's it's somehow related to the underlying insured business. And so just like when folks go out with their businesses and buy real estate that they want to become their own landlords, this is a very similar idea where they're setting up an insurance company of their own to um, provide insurance risk to their business because uh, the type of risks we're talking about are usually um, low frequency, not things that you would expect to happen very much, but high severity. So whether they realize it or not, a business owner is already self-insuring for risks in this manner because if they don't have insurance coverage through someone like you, Jeff, they are their own insurance company. Um, and so th- th- I think that's an important idea, at least to just get in the head right away, is this is an insurance company owned I- I- tangentially to the the core business and is structured in a way as to provide the the appropriate requirements of of what constitutes insurance. And that, that's always the challenge. Um, that's that's where there's some variation in the various opportunities out there is how these things are structured. Um, but there's, there's two uh, primary components of what constitutes an insurance company. And I'm going to actually let R- kind of Rich discuss these. There's two ways, two things an insurance company has to have, Rich. What are those? I would be risk transfer and risk distribution. And that is what insurance is, whether we all pay $100 a month to our local auto insurer, we each pay $100. And in theory, if we don't get in an accident, the the all states, the state farms, those agents, they keep and hold those assets. And then when Mike gets in an accident, then there's the the assets there to pay those claims. Conceptually, it's no different. It's exactly the same principle. That is what insurance is. Insuring the operating company through premiums to their own company, their own captive insurance company. So that's the risk shifting is when they pay the premium and the contract comes over, their insurance company picks up the risk of the underlying company. Correct. So that's component number one to make sure that we have an insurance company. What's component number two? Is risk transfer, meaning that exposure needs to be shared in the the pool of large numbers so that when someone makes a claim, if Mike makes a claim, then all of our collective premiums or either through pooling or treaties, pay that claim. And that essentially is the foundation of captive insurance right there. So typically, we'll we'll start with historically, we have group captives. Everybody pays X amount of dollars. 25 construction companies all pool their workman's comp into one pool, and they share each other's exposure. For the risks, uh, that's, that's group captives. These, there's lots of different types of captives, and we can talk about 831As, 831Bs, which are sections of the code, of the IRS code. And then we get into series captives and single parent captives and all the variations, which are all ensuring risk of the operating So before company. we get into those structures... Let's talk about the risks that are typically associated or that we typically deal with when we're yeah. you know, working with businesses that are approaching the idea of implementing captive. What are they concerned about? What are they talking yeah. about? You mentioned it earlier. It's low-frequency, high-severity exposures. And I'll start with a couple that everybody would understand and exposures that are available in the commercial market. Um, Jeff, you probably offer directors and officers mm-hmm. coverage, okay? So if, if my operating company has directors and officers, 
we need to, we, if I feel that I want to formally insure against that exposure and risk of somebody doing something bad or illegal, I would come to you and you, it would go through underwriting and you'd go to the commercial carriers and it may be underwritten and priced at $100,000 a year. Great. So the operating company pays $100,000 to travelers or whoever, whoever that is, and they have that protection. With captive insurance, we would offer and underwrite the exact same coverage, but now the business owner is paying that $100,000 to their own company. So if there are no claims, that insurance company becomes profitable the business owners profitable. So what are some of the other risks? There's like, yeah, the other big one I know that really hit this last year is cyber coverage. Yeah. Cyber. I mean, common things, cyber risk, which is all, there's all sorts of specifics in that, but there's cyber risk. There's loss of a key client. There's over 65 different exposures that we can ensure business income, business income, pandemic, every Mm -hmm. uh, last year, 2020, despite, the fact that we are in the, still in the middle of a pandemic was the greatest year for captives, at least from an understanding point, because now everybody in this entire world, and specifically in our country, understand what business interruption is. Yep. And so we can ensure that as a broad coverage, just loss of income due to business interruption, and we can, with the right administrator and such, we can underwrite specifically pandemic coverage. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when we used to go out there and talk with business owners, you know, coming up with hypotheticals of, well, when is this going to come into play? Like, help me really understand when this is going to be an issue. (laughs) And now it's like, uh, can you cover this? Can you cover (laughs) this? You know, they, they start rattling off all their own types of exposures that they supply chain interruption, Mm -hmm. you know, um, earthquake insurance for property owners. Um, we've had bed bug coverage for people who own apartment complexes or, or hotels, that sort of thing. Reputational risk, loss of a license. Uh, Literally there's a key, business partner or, yes. or manager yeah. or a key account yeah. or loss of a market supply chain interruption yeah mm-hmm. um, accounts receivable businesses understand yeah. there's dollars coming and going and if they have a big client that declares bankruptcy subcontractors there's no one to go to there anymore that's right you can ensure that kind of risk yes so they're very unique risks I th- and I think that's another one of the paradigm shifts about captives is you're not thinking entirely of displacing what would normally be your catastrophic risk coverage, the the property and casualty, that sort of stuff. We're talking about um, ongoing business, like you say, loss of income risks that aren't as commonly purchased through the public markets. Yeah. Um, and, and let me just add, why would a business owner want to pay insurance premium? Because typically, I don't, I'm a great driver, so I don't want to have auto insurance, but it's required by law. And I would self-insure informally if I if I could, because I could save my hundred dollars a month times however many. That's why cars we just have liability, have. right? There you go. Yeah, it is. So we have those options. Once a business owner understands, though, that insurance companies are designed to be profitable, now insurance becomes exciting. And what they were informally insuring before, hoping that it didn't happen or hiring good employees and business practices and and hiring different things. Now, business owners see, I can create a new profit center, protect my operating company, and have my insurance company profitable. And here's where I... Sometimes, or this is where my emphasis, my tax background really comes into play because not only is there potential for profit center in the concept of insurance generally, but the code, as as Rich was mentioning earlier, actually provides tax incentives to establish these types of companies. And by tax incentives, what I mean there is if a... Uh, let me, let me okay. change tax incentives to tax consequences, and they're very positive. Uh, Or I'd use tax preferences. There you go. I mean, 
whether we admit it or not, the entire code, and you guys have heard me talk about this before, is an incentive-based structure. It's either trying to get you to do something or not to do something. So when the, when the code giveth away, it intends to essentially support or validate certain activities, right? When we save for retirement, we get a tax deferral going into that account. It's because some genius decided that that was a good thing to promote vis-a-vis the code. So when there's a tax preference um, associated with something, it's generally viewed as something that's an endorsed, not tacitly, but impliedly endorsed as a valid concept under the code. So in the, in the sense of a captive insurance company, there are two different ways to look at it. The one that we work where a lot of the entry point for captive insurance is through code section 831B. And, and the reason why this is so attractive from a structuring standpoint, again, they've already decided they want to get insurance. They want to do this insurance structure. But it's essentially indirectly subsidized through tax preference by virtue of the fact that when someone pays premium to that captive insurance company, they get a deduction to their operating company, but it is not taxed to the insurance company upon receipt. Up to $2.3 million dollars of premium can be received by a single captive without paying any income tax on the recipient side. So that's essentially a, a tax exemption to the, to the insurance company. So let me just restate what Nate said, and that is following Section 831B of the code and the limits that are currently in place, and we could have a history lesson, but... They've gone up they've in the gone past up. five years. Yes, it used to be one... $1.2 million per captive per year, and it went to $2.2 million. Now it's at $2.3 million per captive per year. And that's a tremendous opportunity to understand exactly how much we can insure to protect our operating companies and then receive the tax benefits and consequences of that, which are very positive from beginning to end with insurance companies. Captive insurance is a multi-billion dollar industry. When I started in the captive arena 10 years ago, people hadn't even heard of it. Even legal professionals, accountants and attorneys. And so there was a lot of education. Now, just a few years later, I would say that everybody has heard of it now, but there are very few that know how to execute and implement and maintain properly and structurally and legally, compliantly, all the variables that go with captive insurance. I just want to. Oh, sorry, you want to say no, something? No, I. I want to want you to finish up. I was going to emphasize first. just emphasize what Rich has said there because I did the uh, Masters of Taxation program at DU back in 2001, and I often tell folks that you know it's not surprising that people don't have a lot of exposure and understanding of this because even to those kind of high-level tax professionals, it involved probably all of 45 seconds of lecture time in a, you know, <laughs> in a quarter or, or in a year program and uh, about a page and a half of notes that we basically just skimmed over. That's how commonplace these were back in 2001. If you had to be a Fortune 500 or very significant going concern because there's just a lot involved in setting them up. As time went on, a couple of changes happened that just made them a little bit more appealing from a tax perspective, from a compliance perspective, reporting and that sort of thing. And then just the the evolution of local law, you know, whether it be Delaware or Tennessee or North Carolina, some of these jurisdictions locally that host, in a sense, these these captive insurance companies became much more sophisticated and, and it was able to... Um, make them more turnkey with with captive managers and that sort of thing. As well as the pricing, because there are expenses involved with captive insurance, and they're not necessarily light or small, but the point of entry is much, much more accessible to more and more businesses every single year. Yeah, and and that's kind of where I wanted to, to, to transition to as we kind of close out this session here today is, um, uh, what are what is the ideal business profile 
um, as we think about captives. There, there's certainly now more that everybody's accessible. salivating over the <laughs> yeah, idea, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, I'm small business. I'm going to get on this right now. We're going to put the traditional insurance industry out of business and do this. Not but, quite, but yeah. yeah, no, that's a very good question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's important because they are much more accessible than they used to be. And um, and and I think we'd, we'll all be surprised here after you guys kind of recap that um, as to what size businesses, types of businesses, things like that would would actually uh, be be good candidates to actually take a look at this. As, this may weed out might weed out a little bit yeah. a few of our listeners today, but um, nonetheless, I think it's it's very interesting. And and I'll just kick in and let Rich handle most of this. But it's similar to how when we were talking about ESOPs a few weeks back, there is a, there's a sweet spot for them. That doesn't mean that if, you, if you're listening and you don't fit that sweet spot, it's not a question worth asking your advisors to, to explore it further. But I'll say as a general matter, you really got to, if you're handsomely profitable, that's kind of my threshold question. If, if you've got a nice handsome profit that's coming through to your taxable income and you have a lot of risk exposure to that handsome profit that you're generating the the which the, they have to yeah the period anybody that is generating the type of revenue required to qualify has tremendous exposure period but if you want to go over some of the more yeah. specifics that you kind of use as guidelines for people to measure yeah there's three matrix that i identify and it's not that a Operating business has to qualify in all three areas, but just one of these, any one of these. And I'll spend the most time on the first one. And it's what I, what was just described, and that is what is a sweet spot? The sweet spot is a privately owned company that grosses, that gross revenue is 20 to $100 million. Now, let me explain that and a few disclaimers. As Nate just said, we can do a much smaller than that, and we can and do create captive insurance companies for companies much, much larger than that as well. So why privately held and why in that arena? Well, as a business grows and they're small, they typically don't have those reserves or excess profit initially as profits are going into expansion, acquisitions, um, all the things that typical businesses go through as they grow. So on, that's on the low end. On the high end, what happens is a company goes public or private it, equity. Private equity. The ownership becomes diluted, and it makes it harder. the The business still has plenty of exposure, but making a decision and it becomes harder and harder and more and more diluted. So that that's that's why. We can we could do them for any operation because all organizations have risk, and I believe that every profitable organization should have captive insurance because it protects them and it creates a new profit center and and we could get, I could give you a, a lot of other ands. So I'll just repeat the sweet spot I've learned in my experience is companies grossing twenty to one hundred million dollars in gross revenue. So that's matrix number one. Matrix number two is a company that has in commercial insurance spends a million dollars or thereabouts, give or take, doesn't have to be exactly a million. But if they are paying in the traditional insurance markets a million dollars, then we could save them hundreds of thousands of dollars because they could redirect those. An example of that might be like fleet coverages. Like if yes. you have companies with, you know, logistics companies with lots of property and yeah. casualty on their trucks. and Correct. In Las Vegas, some of the transportation companies down there have that. Or workman's comp. Or, 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 or there's so many examples, I don't want to limit that opportunity, but that's where traditional group captives, as the model came to be, hey, let's pool 25 insurance companies. We pay a lot in workman's comp. Let's pool that risk together like an and share that. captain yes of yeah construction companies that's correct of, right and they're there's they've been around the longest and those are simple and and sometimes it, it's a good model for people um, the third matrix is really simple and really fast and that is 
if the company, operating company, has 100 employees, then they should emphatically own a captive insurance company. That's simple. Does it have to be exactly? No, if they're at 90, if they're at 75 employees, it's fine. If they're at 10,000 employees, it's okay. But it's a simple, non-threatening matrix that anybody can ask and answer. How many employees do you have? 100? You should own a captive. And it's that simple. The, re the reason for that, this is a teaser for our next podcast, <laughs> and I'll get into the reasons for that in our next podcast, but it's a very simple matrix that way. And, and, and just a, a little info for our listeners out there. You may Google captives and find a whole bunch of information that says, oh, the IRS is cracking down on them. Well, they're always looking at them because they're abused. Um, and we're not talking about abuse here. We're talking about using a captive legally underneath the terms that it's established uh, per the IRS regulations. Yes. And again, we could have an entire podcast on the history of that, the percentage of that, what is right, what is wrong. The boundaries have clearly been defined. And if you do want to do research, talk to a legal expert like Nathan, research the PATH Act, which increased the premium limits on 831B captives. Also, little note there, QSBS, I'm sure you'll hear. We have done a, some qualified there you go. stock discussions. There, those the are the yeah. two of this long legislation passed while – President Obama was a president. Those are the two factors in there that impact the people that I work with significantly is QSBS and captive insurance. Well, and just a closing thought to what you just said, Mike, because we actually had someone say they looked it up after we introduced it to them and they saw all the bad stuff and they're like, there must be something good here. Because <laughs> <laughs> if it's this bad, it must be good. And, and to clarify, it's, we're not talking about offshoring money in you know, some foreign Absolutely country. Absolutely not. And that's this, one this of the things. Is, this is U.S. domiciled money. Yeah. Is it, and that's one of the things that made the market explode was when. Um, captive managers who are like your third-party administrators of captive insurance, just like your 401k company manages your 401k. There's managers out there that manage captives, and there was an explosion within the marketplace um, in, in about 2009 that started to bring all those captives that used to be offshore to U.S. markets, and the U.S. markets responded, like Delaware and Tennessee and a few others. Utah is a great captive jurisdiction, so... Yeah. Enough to make your head spin, which I'm sure we've done to some. <laughs> well, yeah, and probably enough to uh, tune into our next podcast here. So Absolutely. So uh, definitely um, um, certainly piqued my interest, and uh, I'm, a, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, have Rich back, and we'll, uh, we'll get into some more of the details and, and answer some of these questions that you've kind of led us down the road to, uh, to asking here. So uh, with that, we'll uh, sign off for now. Um, we want to thank each of our listeners uh, for tuning in, and uh, just know that your expert team uh, is here to serve you. And we will uh, we will uh, tune in, or you will tune in, hopefully, uh, at our next podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else. And join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal, investment, or accounting advice, and the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through ANI Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.